we are in the Huap River, uh, just north of the Peter's Pool. We've just got a call in from Dr. Flap Standard. Uh, we've been we've been tracking for the past 48 hours. We've been tracking two lionesses, and he gave us a call in. And then we're moving through to go and um, recolor them, take some data that we need, and then uh, put them with a with a satellite collar because they have just been with uh, BHF collars for the past uh, couple of months. So we just wanna get out there and get to experience all of that. So we started um, about a week ago, I guess, uh, and our first mission was to, to try and locate the Orbab lionesses. Um, and uh, we met in the Huap River. So what had transpired there is that um, we already started picking up the tracks of these two lionesses. And then essentially we, um, we followed them for like three days um, before we picked up the, the radio telemetry signal. And I mean, you are very much part of assisting and helping finding the tracks uh, in the WAP, which was uh, was complicated by the, the the bad winds. I mean, we had some really uh, significant east winds that uh, that destroyed tracks and and cleaned the area. So it was quite hard work. Um, and w with the fact that the lines were moving incredible distances, you know, every day. So um, in the end, we, we picked up the, the radio signal and the lines towards the end of, I think it was the third day. So it was only the fourth day um, that we managed to actually get a hold of them um, down in the reeds in, in the world, which was, uh, which was quite tricky, you know, to, to try and get them out of there. And, um, and it worked quite well in the end that, um, you know, we, with the permission from the Ministry of Environment, we were able to get a springbok carcass. Uh, to lure them out and then I used uh, sound playbacks um, of a, uh, a distress call of an oryx which basically uh, um, at attracted them and they came out of the reeds and and I think we got some beautiful uh, uh, footage of them coming out and, and walking across those, those sort of rocky plains and ridges um, and until they eventually came, came to the carcass. Yeah. Tell us a little bit more about um, the whole the darting and then the recalling, the type of drug that you use so that the, our viewers can get to understand more about uh, the how how you go how we go about that. Yeah. yeah. Look, uh, fitting radio collars and satellite collars uh, to lions is one of the most important uh, elements of the project, uh, and because that's essentially how we um, we can follow them. Uh, the collars all have GPS. Uh, um, units in them that record their position every hour during the day. So uh, that's really important information and in us understanding uh, the, the movement patterns, how they utilize the habitat um, and, uh, and, and also especially when it comes to, to human wildlife conflict, uh, that knowledge of understanding their ecological characteristic of where they move and how they utilize the habitat is, is, is essential for us in, in trying to curb and, and manage conflict. So yeah, that uh, fitting collars is really an, an important thing, but it is, uh, it's quite a difficult job, um, given that uh, you know, the lions move over such enormous areas and, uh, and the terrain is, is rugged. You, know, you, you saw how we had to travel you know, over mountains and plains and dunes and you know, marshes even. Yeah. So um, it's, a, it's a dynamic area and, and finding the lions and getting to them is, is often a very tricky business. You know? yeah. So it took us four days to eventually end up uh, uh, with the lionesses and then um, you know, darting them and fitting the collars um, is you know, an equally complex yeah. problem because uh, you know, we, we have to essentially, most of the time, attract them out of an area that's, that's inaccessible. Um, and then immobilizing them, that puts them at risk. You know, uh, every darting is always a, a, a real concern for me because, uh, you know, mortalities do happen. I've been very fortunate that I've not lost a lion during a, 
a darting session, but um, one can never be too relaxed about that. Yeah. So yeah, I think we were, we were very fortunate um, in that we, we managed to get them just after dark. Um, and it was quite a, a nice, peaceful uh, and, and, and relaxing type of immobilization. Not, not a lot of stress to the animals. Mm -hmm. And they woke up really quite beautifully, uh, quite smoothly. You know, we could see that in the video material yeah. of the two of them sort of exploring the area yeah. uh, where they were darted. And, and, you know, from the material, from the video material, one can really see that they're very relaxed. And, and, and that's sort of what we aim for. And, yeah. and I think we were, we were lucky in, in achieving that. Uh, so in terms of the, the baiting setup that we that we did that day, um, what were the factors that was contributing to it becoming a very successful outcome of... of, of, yeah. of, of, of Look, uh, there we, we, we had to consider um, a lot of the sort of environmental uh, uh, issues and, and, and conditions. Mm -hmm. So there was, in, during the day there was a strong east wind blowing. But the previous day and the day before that, in the late afternoon, the, the wind turned and, uh, and we sort of had to anticipate that and hope that would happen. So the whole setup was done on the western side, allowing for, for the wind now to switch and carry the scent of, of the, the, the bait towards them. And that was then uh, um, supplemented by a sound playback. I have a lot of recordings that I make all the time of, of lions um, and, and I have a whole array of recordings that I would select and then I would play this back um, at quite loud volume but, uh, but a really good sound quality so the, the, the speaker uh, reproduces the sound quite accurately and that essentially fools you know, the, the lions. Uh, but one has to be one has to be quite careful with that because you know they're intelligent animals and uh, you fool them once but not the second time. Yeah. That uh, process of attracting them to us uh, uh, was 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 very successful. Um, you know they came out of the thickets and we, we selected the, the 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 spot for the darting quite carefully in the sense that. Um, once the lions are immobilized, they can't now move uh, into an inaccessible area like thick reeds or, or mountains or, you know, rocky bits. Um, and as we saw, it was really quite, quite beautiful. They fell asleep right there, right next to each other. Um, and, you know, just by looking at the, the body language of the sleeping lions, you, you, can, you can tell that, you know, they were, they were calm. It wasn't a stressful situation. So that worked out very well. How, how important is it to keep on uh, the monitoring how they wake up and then the next 24 or 48 hours uh, how does that yeah. how does that look involve? you're right that that is a, a very important element um, because you know we put these the lions the animals under under risk by immobilizing them and then it becomes really our responsibility to make sure that uh, no harm comes uh, their way and that they can recover uh, fully um, from that ordeal. Uh, and, and we have to ensure that, uh, that sort of security with them. Now, with the, the type of drugs we use, um, it's a combination of a, a, you know, a hallucinogenic uh, that is supplemented with a very strong sedative. So as a result, because of the hallucinogenic elements, the animals can go into convulsions and they can, they can freak out and by disturbance. So a big effort is always made to keep the, the disturbance as little as possible during a, a, an immobilization when the lions are, are asleep. Their eyes are open, um, so they are subject to all kinds of stimuli. Mm -hmm. and, and we have to keep that st stimulus to the, to the absolute minimum, which is why we were so quiet around the lion and we, we didn't talk loudly. And, uh, and we just, you know, limited the, the, the possible disturbance. And then working with them relatively quickly, within an hour, we can do all the necessary work we do. We fit the radio collars, we collect some biological information, measurements, um, age them from, based on the, the extent of wear on their teeth. Um, and then it's basically time to, to wake them up. Um, and that's done with, a, with an antidote that's uh, not a, a specific antidote, it just reduces the recovery time, um, you know, quite significantly. But in that time, th they can have, be subject to no disturbance at all, which is sort of why everybody leaves. And then I monitor them in total darkness with the aid of, of night vision. Uh, infrared and thermal image uh, uh, cameras so that then they basically the vehicle is there it was there before they were immobilized it's essentially still in the same place mm -hmm. 
and, and, and there's no noise or movement comes from the vehicle, yeah. yet I monitor and, and record the whole recovery process. Um, and I mean, over the years, that's something that I've sort of d developed and in a way half perfected, yes. the strategy of working with it. Uh, and, and, it and, and, and it works well. Um, simply because it, darting and fitting collars is such a key thing, we, we have to ensure that it, it has the minimum sort of level of disturbance uh, and that the animals do not remember everything and carry everything from that ordeal away with them. And I, I believe that we were very successful with those two lionesses because we've, we've observed them the following morning and, you know, we, we, we could really see that uh, they, they were not any worse off <laughs> from that experience. Yeah. The two lionesses are from the Obab area, right? Yeah, correct. Uh, yeah. But the, 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 the area in which we, we, we found them, we located them, is, is almost a lot of um, a couple of kilometers away from yes. their natural yeah. area where they are. So yeah. once we have collected the data from once you have collected the data from the uh, telemetry uh, from the collars and so on, how was their movement and what could be the factors that contributes to them moving so far out of the area yeah. which they normally stay in? You know, you're very right. That that is such an interesting uh, uh, aspect of the ecology of, of desert adapted lions. So, you know, all the prides or the little groups will have a, a, a name associated to them, which is, you know, sort of the, an, related to an area. Mm -hmm. So the Orbap lionesses um, are named after the Orbap uh, River and uh, when they were younger uh, that's the area that they lived in but subsequently over the years they've expanded their home range quite significantly and that is true from every group of lions, every pride of lions in, in, in this northern Namib desert habitat. Uh, and, and that is a, a, a functional um, a mechanism of them surviving in this habitat. So over time, if we monitor the groups of lions for long enough, which you know this project has been really fortunate in doing, um, so we have records of lions that go over 20 years. Um, they live that long. So, um, and, and in that time, it's incredible how they move. They change their their home range areas. Mm -hmm. Um, they will eventually probably go back to become the Orbap lionesses. But at the moment, there is no food in Orbap, yes. you know, so hence there are no lions there. Yeah. And what has happened is they've essentially migrated into the Huap Prides area. And yeah. somehow the Huap and the Orbap females are finding a way to live there together. Not at the same time, but the area is big enough that um, they never at the same place at the same time, but they, be, they have to be able to adapt uh, in, in that way to, to access food and, and get the prey animals. So that's very important for us to understand the extent of, of that movement and how it varies. And that's why fitting of the radio collars and collecting the data and, and analyzing and understanding where they move uh, is so key to, to our understanding of the population and then you know, the next step is, is the effective management um, of, of the desert lions. Jason, what's your view? How did you get have the experience? Well, we as a team just had the amazing privilege to join um, Dr. Flux Thunder as he recolored the two lionesses that he's been searching for for months. And to see him at work and, you know, his team with the lion rangers and the rapid response unit, it's a well-oiled machine and you know to see those lionesses in the condition as you mentioned of how amazingly pristine they are looking through these tough times really gives us hope for the lion population out here in Namibia.